chewy, chunky, crumbly, chocolatey, buttery, coconutty. A cookie is the perfect treat for any occasion. And there are so many delicious recipes to choose from. On today's show, I'm going to teach you how to bake a few of my favorites. These amazing breakfast cookies studded on top with dried banana, full of goodness. One should last you an entire day. And coconut macaroons, three different variations of delicious macaroons that are no longer just for Passover. And brown butter cookies, these are utterly delicious. Rolled in glistening sandy sugar, they're made out of browned butter. And graham crackers. Have you ever made your own graham crackers? Well, today I'm going to show you how. Stay tuned for today's Martha Bakes. Now, how would you like to make a cookie that looks like this? This giant cookie that is actually a healthy and delicious way to start your day. This is called our breakfast cookie. This recipe makes eight large cookies or 14 small. And they have all kinds of delicious ingredients, including dried mango, papaya, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, raisins, unsweetened coconut. So start by creaming one pound of unsalted butter. Add three cups of dark brown sugar, packed. And a box of brown sugar has approximately three and a half cups of sugar. So for this recipe, I just take out a half a cup of sugar from the total amount. Now scrape down the bowl and then add four large eggs. This starts off like pretty much any old cookie, but then it gets more and more interesting. Let the egg get incorporated before you add the next egg. And we have two cups of whole wheat flour. I love storing my flour and my oats and my nuts in glass covered jars like this. It's just a very handy way of easy storage, easy access, easy use. Two cups all purpose flour and add a half a teaspoon of salt and one and a half teaspoons of baking soda. And you can whisk these ingredients together. So it's only four cups of flour, but it makes so many giant cookies. To your eggs and sugar and butter, add one tablespoon plus one teaspoon of vanilla. So I'll start spooning in the dry ingredients now. You need a very strong mixer for this, and this stand mixer is really, really good for this kind of heavy-duty cookie. Finish all the flour, then add your oatmeal, four cups of oats. So, speed it up. You can take the bowl off and we will add all the dried fruits and nuts. Heavy, rich, very delicious. This would be great for a bake sale. Okay, so now we have to chop up the almonds, finish chopping the papaya. Thrown in with the rest of the papaya. So all together, oh, approximately a quarter of a cup of papaya, a half a cup of dried mango, finely chopped half a cup of raisins, half a cup of pumpkin seeds. These are so great. And a half a cup of sunflower seeds. And a half a cup of unsweetened coconut. And a cup of almonds, just coarsely chopped. Make sure you get every almond chopped. The whole almond would just be a little bit too large for this cookie. There. Okay, so this can go right into the bowl also. And stir this up. Such fun. Now, this is really too much for the machine to handle. 
So I suggest doing just what I'm doing, stirring everything in by hand. But get way down to the bottom. I see some coconut down there. And then to form the cookies, we'll clean up and get our pans out. So I'm using, this is a half cup measure. This is a perfect measuring cup for the small version. Still makes a very sizable cookie. And I think I can get maybe four on a tray. Notice I'm forming these on parchment. And you could use a big ice cream scoop too, if you so choose. So these can be formed right on the parchment paper. Sort of like hamburger patties, think of it that way. You want them about the same thickness and about the same diameter. And then stud the top with banana chips. These are available also at the health food store wherever you bought your dried fruits. Mmm, looks good. Don't try to put more than three. Three really is plenty. Have your oven preheated at 350 degrees. Bake until golden and firm, and that takes about 20 to 25 minutes. So I still have a few more cookies to form. I will do some large also. And while I'm doing this, you just take one of those cookies we already baked and taste it. You'll love it. Don't tell anybody, but this is a great breakfast. A homemade cappuccino and a breakfast cookie like this, really good. Now this is a cookie that I really love. It's a traditional holiday treat, macaroons. You make them for Passover. They are gluten-free. They have a dense, moist inside and they're crunchy on the outside and they are simply irresistible. Now I'm adding three and a half egg whites for two and a half cups of unsweetened coconut. These are small eggs, so I'm gonna use a little tiny egg to just moisten the coconut. You'll use anywhere from three to four eggs, depending on the size. And a pinch of salt. So once the eggs are broken up, add all the egg whites. You don't want them too wet, but you don't want them too dry. One teaspoon of vanilla. Be prepared to use your hands. Be prepared to get your fingers full of macaroon. Have a bowl of water for your hands. And you want to make these uniform size, so I find the best way to do that with cookie dough is to use an ice cream scoop. Take your scoop. This is a two tablespoon scoop. And just put it on the piece of parchment paper. I think I will form these in my hands. So you can make this dough yesterday. It becomes a little bit more easy to use. Or you can just make them fresh like this. And they're an unusual shape, a little bit pyramidal and pinched. But you don't want them too compressed because you want them to kind of melt in your mouth. Preheat your oven to 325 degrees and bake 16 to 17 minutes. This will make anywhere from nine to 12 macaroons. Now, if you wanna make kind of chocolatey ones, you just add a half a cup of semi-sweet chocolate, just stir it into the coconut. That will make a mildly chocolate macaroon. And then this one will be a very chocolatey macaroon, four ounces of semi-sweet chocolate melted. And, oh, cocoa powder, a quarter of a cup of beautiful dark cocoa powder. So this is the chocolate version. You have to up the coconut to two and two thirds cups of unsweetened coconut and uh, use four large egg whites. And that's a really rich macaroon. So to show you what that looks like, I'll show you, I'll just make one of each. Better start with a light one. It sticks together very nicely. So that'll be a chocolate studded macaroon and this will be a chocolate macaroon. Now you can use sweetened coconut, but if you're gonna use the sweetened coconut, then reduce the sugar from three quarters of a cup to one tablespoon. I'll show you what they look like when they come out of the oven. 
So this is what the macaroon looks like when it comes out of the oven. This has cooled a bit, but if you break into it, you can see that it is moist and flaky and delicious and chewy. It's what a coconut macaroon should be. Now, I like to dip the point about halfway in melted semi-sweet chocolate and let that harden. That is a wonderful dessert cookie. Now displayed on cake stands like this, macaroons are fabulous. Look at the variety. The chocolate chip, the chocolate, the plain, and the chocolate dipped macaroons, not just for Passover anymore, they're for every day. Just the name of the cookie, brown butter cookies, makes you want to make this cookie. This kind of icebox cookie dates way back to the 1930s when electric refrigerators were gaining in popularity. But what makes these cookies so special is the brown butter, which gives them a subtle nutty flavor. And I am making the brown butter right now. It's 15 tablespoons of butter, unsalted, and you just cook it over a kind of a medium low flame until the butter turns brown, a beurre noisette in French, or hazelnut butter. The brownness comes from the milk solids in the butter as it melts, turning brown. There is a fine line between brown and black burnt, so be very, very careful not to burn those little bits. It takes, oh, maybe 10 or 12 minutes to do. And we have one that's already brown and already cooled. Do you see the color? It is perfect. So now pour your butter into a large bowl and make sure you scrape out all of the brown bits. This is the kind of butter that my mom would always put on top of her potato pierogies, on top of her cauliflower, steamed cauliflower. It's just a delicious butter. Now in another bowl, the drying ingredients, a half a cup of granulated sugar, and two cups of all-purpose flour. It's nice to scrape the top like this, just level it off. So two cups and one teaspoon of fresh baking powder and a half a teaspoon of salt. And just use your wire whisk to get this all mixed evenly. Now into the butter, put two teaspoons of best vanilla extract. And now you can just dump your flour right into the butter and stir. It'll make a simple butter cookie. Now generally butter cookies are creamed butter and sugar and eggs. And this has no eggs. It really could be done all in one bowl too. So this could be called the one bowl cookie. Mm. It smells fantastic. So this looks like a good consistency. And if you find that it is a little bit wet, just add a touch more flour. So here we have our beautiful moist dough and it has to be rolled into a cylinder that's 14 inches long. And we've cut the parchment paper exactly 14 inches. So you can make it a little bit flat to start and then we're gonna roll it round. We have a little trick. We save all our paper towel cardboards and that will help keep this rigid and round while you're chilling it in the refrigerator. And if you're proficient with one of these wonderful, this is the bamboo that forms the sushi rolls, this will help you really put a little bit of even pressure on your dough. It works very nicely. I watch all my favorite sushi chefs form their beautiful hand rolls, and this really does work well. Oh, it's perfect this way. So now, put this right inside your paper towel holder. If you have another piece of this bamboo, you could wrap it in that and leave that in the refrigerator. But you see, this is just the right size, and we can use a piece of tape to tape it, and you won't have a cylinder of dough flopping around your refrigerator. And this really has to chill for at least two hours and preferably longer until it gets nice and cold. I like wrapping it in a piece of plastic wrap just so that the ends are covered. 
and get that right into the fridge to chill. So here's our chilled roll of cookie dough. Release this from the tube. Be very careful because it is dry and uh, it can crack. Let's see how it looks. Oh, it looks very good. Perfect. So now with egg white, just brush the whole surface. Make sure you cover the whole surface because you want the sanding sugar, the sparkly sugar to stick to the outside of this roll. And what I would do is just sprinkle the sugar right here on the same paper and roll the cylinder in this sparkly sugar. You see how nicely it sticks? So you'll have a nice sparkly edge to your cookies. And then cut the cookies into a little less than a half inch. I would say about three eighths of an inch thick. Oh, these are cutting perfectly. If they're the right consistency, they will cut just like this. Make sure your oven is preheated to 350 degrees and bake them until they are just slightly golden brown. That's gonna take anywhere from 15 to 17 minutes. So this has to get right into the oven. Now you can roll the cylinder in colored sugar for holidays or finely chopped nuts or even finely chopped dry candied fruit. And the cookies can be stored in an airtight container at room temperature for at least three days. But they're not gonna last that long. Now these cookies will disappear immediately so you don't even have to think about how to pack them for storage. They are really a beautiful, delectable, melting your mouth cookie. And I just like to put them on a pedestal like this and see what happens. They won't stay there very long. I'm keeping a ready supply of this deeply nutty, beautifully flavored dough on hand for instant sweet gratification. Keep a roll in your freezer. Take it out, thaw it a little bit, slice it, bake it. Everybody will be happy. Enjoy. Now here's yet another fantastic cookie to make at home. Flat, crisp, and made with graham flour. Graham crackers can be used to make s'mores, a crumb base for your favorite cream pie, or they can be enjoyed simply on their own. Graham flour, this is what it looks like. It's kind of a grayish brownish color. It's named after the American Presbyterian minister, Reverend Sylvester Graham. He was an early advocate for dietary reform, and he had high hopes of diverting people away from the less healthy refined white flour. So in honor of Reverend Graham, we're gonna show you how to make your own Graham crackers. And Graham flour is whole wheat flour that is more coarsely ground. So for the crackers themselves, six tablespoons of unsalted butter, a third of a cup of light brown sugar, one tablespoon of best honey. Mm, so good. One egg. Cream that all together. You can add a quarter of a teaspoon of salt and your dry ingredients, three quarters of a cup of all-purpose flour. If you try to make these crackers out of all graham, they would just be too strong tasting and pretty dry. So that's three quarters of a cup of graham flour. Don't forget the baking powder, a quarter of a teaspoon, and a half a teaspoon of baking soda. These work very well. I make them every summer up in Maine because I have an outdoor fire and we make s'mores and tell ghost stories. And you need a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Whisk that all together and add your dry ingredients. This is a roll cookie. You're going to roll the dough, but we're gonna do it between two pieces of parchment paper for very easy technique. And now you can release the beater. Now I'll show you how to roll it out. Now, have you ever wondered why graham crackers have holes in them? 
Well, I have, but it's really because when they're baking, they need to release steam. Otherwise they would get bubbles in them and you want crackers to be nice and flat. So here's the dough. It's come together very nicely. And we want to roll this out in a nice flat rectangle. And rolling it out between these sheets of parchment really helps get it nice and flat. And you're going to chill this until it's rigid. And like pie dough, you should really roll in one direction and then in another direction. There, that's nice. Put it on a cookie sheet. You can put this right in the freezer and get it nice and rigid. So now, here is the stiff dough. Just peel away the top parchment. And using a straight edge, we are going to cut this into nice squares, but dock it first. This is a docking tool to make holes evenly spaced. And this will keep the crackers nice and flat during baking. And we're going to use for the edges, this little pie cutter. and pull away the little crumbs. If you wanna make some really pretty, um, unusual um, desserts, you can make star graham crackers, you can do Christmas trees for Maine. Of course, we're in the woods with spruce trees and here we have a, a nice cookie cutter. Um, but um, I am in the process here of making crackers. And now we're ready to cut into squares. So always start by dividing your dough in half and then in half again. They are so beautiful. And I think I can only get three out of it this way. I will cut this into thirds. That's pretty good. So now get this right back into the freezer and get it rigid again and you're going to then bake them. So here we have a batch that's very nicely chilled. So what you want is to respace these and get them right back on a cookie sheet and bake them on parchment in a preheated 350 degree oven for approximately 12 to 14 minutes. And you can rotate the crackers halfway through the 12 minutes. Now, if your cracker is sticking, and these are sticking a little bit, just take the offset spatula and run right under the cracker. They come up nicely. They release perfectly from the parchment. And there. Just make sure you get these into the cookie sheet and into your preheated oven. So here are the graham crackers. And once you taste one of these crackers, you'll never go back to the store-bought variety again. And remember, these are great for s'mores. They're great for ice cream sandwiches. They are great for dipping in milk and cut into animal shapes. They would be the perfect animal crackers. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. Set your timer. Looks really good, tastes even better. Enjoy. Today's episode of Martha Bakes is all about bar cookies. Not only are these one pound wonders rich and delicious, they're guaranteed to be best sellers at your big sale. Peanut butter and jelly bars, a new take on an old favorite. Dark chocolate spelt brownies, incorporating spelt flour. And pecan bars, these are my favorite pecan bars ever. And dried fruit and nut health bars, great for hiking. All of this on today's Martha Bakes.
This recipe takes everyone's favorite childhood combination of peanut butter and jelly and transforms that combination into a sweet treat for all ages, a peanut butter and jelly bar. It's very easy to make. We're using a nine by 13 inch metal rectangular pan. I'm buttering just the corners and a little bit of the bottom just so the parchment liner sticks. And here's a way that we've always used parchment. If you use two pieces of parchment, cut it a little narrower than the length of the pan and put it like that, let it hang over the sides. And then this piece is a little narrower than the width of the pan, whichever way you're looking at it. And I've already buttered the corners, so nothing's gonna stick in the corners. And just go to your desk and get a few binder clips to hold the parchment securely in place. These work really, really well. So now you can butter the parchment with your soft butter and a brush. It goes very quickly and the little pastry brush works very, very well. Do the sides. Now we can start with the batter. Three cups of all-purpose unbleached flour. And you can just put this flour right into a large mixing bowl and we'll sift it with your wire whisk. I like sifting this way because it works very well. One and a half teaspoons of salt. This is a half teaspoon measure, so I'll do it three times. And one teaspoon of fresh baking powder. Mix these together. And we're ready with the dry ingredients. Now the moist ingredients, butter. Two sticks of butter, one cup. Cream the butter. And notice it's at room temperature, so it creams quickly. If you put ice cold sticks of butter in your machine, it's going to take a long time to cream with the sugar. One and a half cups of granulated sugar. And I'm adding it in half cup increments. and add two large eggs. And now to this mixture, add your two and a half cups of peanut butter. And we are sliding the peanut butter into the bowl. Now, the reason this is sliding out of the bowl is because I prepared the bowl a little bit with a little vegetable spray. That helps these kinds of heavy mixtures like corn syrup, molasses, even peanut butter to slide out of the bowl. And it's a good tip. And now one teaspoon of good vanilla. Just add the dry ingredients on low. It will all incorporate. Sprinkle a little bit of flour in the pan. This will help the bar release. Make sure you coat the whole pan with the flour by doing this. That works well. Two thirds of this mixture goes right in the bottom and spread it out as best you can into an even layer. So I like to use an offset spatula like this now getting it even makes a pretty bar. So I advise you to do this carefully. So see, that's nice and flat. Now add one and a half cups of strawberry jam. You could use strawberry, you can use grape, uh, and you could use apricot. Those are my three favorites for this particular bar but I think strawberry is everybody's real favorite. So get this atop the entire layer. So now here, I'm getting my hands dusted with flour because now I'm going to just drop pieces of the remaining batter all over the top. And we're making our top layer, which will be then sprinkled with chopped peanuts. Looks good, don't you think? So make sure your oven's preheated now at 350 degrees. That's pretty much the layers and now the peanuts themselves. 
sprinkled evenly all over the top. Try to cover up every little bit of jam. There. Right into the 350 degree oven for about 45 minutes. These have been well cooled. Remove the clips and see how nicely they come out of the pan. This is such a good recipe and a good technique. So utilize it when making something like this because otherwise this could be a sticky mess. And uh, how big would you like your square? This is very, very rich. So I suggest uh, small little rectangles. So I always start in the middle, serrated knife, cuts beautifully. And let's see, I think I'll do this in thirds. That'll give me six. I better do this in fourths. Having a long serrated knife like this also helps a lot. And there you have peanut butter and jelly delectable bars. Looks really good, tastes even better. Enjoy. Now to chocolate. The addition of spilt flour creates a real chocolatey depth of flavor in these crackly topped brownies made with bittersweet chocolate, and we call them chocolate spelt brownies. They're not only enticing, but they are good for you, as good as chocolate brownies can be. So here's our chocolate, six ounces of bittersweet chocolate. When cut with a serrated knife, it just breaks up into beautiful small pieces, and these go right into a bain-marie, a bowl over simmering water. And with the chocolate, add a half a cup, one stick of unsalted butter. Keep this over kind of a low flame. Now add three quarters of a cup of light brown sugar, packed, and three quarters of a cup of white granulated sugar, and a half a teaspoon of salt. And stir this until it is nicely mixed. Okay, so this comes off the heat, and now we're going to add some cocoa. And this is Dutch processed cocoa, and we need a quarter of a cup. You want it rich and dark, and preferably the Dutch process, where most of the butter fat is removed. And now into this mixture, we're going to stir three eggs. Three. Make sure that the eggs are completely incorporated and that there are no pieces of white or yolk visible. It takes a little while for the eggs to become part of the mixture, but they do. Doesn't that look rich and chocolatey? Now, add your spelt flour. Spelt is a wheat flour. You can buy spelt flour uh, in fine to coarse grind. And you can keep your spelt flour fresh by storing it in the freezer for up to six months. It is a very, very good substitute for all-purpose flour. And it has a sweet and mild taste, reminiscent to some people, including me, of toasted walnuts. And it produces a very fine and delicate crumb in the cake. We've added one quarter of a cup. Now we add another. And altogether, three quarters of a cup of flour. Now, a lot of people think that spelt flour is gluten-free. It is not gluten-free, but it is very low glycemic. And uh, that's a very different thing. So there it is, really beautiful batter. So now fill your baking pan with mixture. And this is the kind of brownie I prefer. No nuts, just brownie batter. And it will get that nice shiny crust, which is what I look for in a well-made brownie. Try to get it all in an even layer and put this right into a 350 degree oven. Uh, when it's done, uh, about 35 minutes, uh, just check it with a cake tester and the tester will come out nice and moist with maybe a little tiny bit of a moist crumb on it. Set your timer. So I'm just taking off the little clips 
and lifting out our gorgeous brownie. Now here's that crust I was talking about. This is what you look for in a well-made brownie. Now, how big would you like your square? I keep asking that question. I think maybe thirds. So cut it in one direction. Mm, boy, these look so mouth-wateringly good. Now, people are very fussy about which brownie they get. That's mine right in the middle. Very important. <laughs> so good. Mm. Now you see a very fine, wet crumb, dense. That's a well-made brownie. And you'll be very surprised, as will your guests, that this was made with spelt flour. Enjoy. Now my favorite of all bars, pecan bars. Layers of texture to find these indulgent pecan bars with their crumbly brown sugar shortbread base and a chewy toffee-like topping. And of course, beautiful fresh pecans. Prepare, as I've shown you, with the parchment paper and butter, a nine by 13 inch rectangular baking pan. Now in a stand mixer, cream two sticks of butter, that's one cup of butter, with three quarters of a cup of light brown sugar packed and a half a teaspoon of salt. Get that nice and creamy and add three cups of all-purpose unbleached flour. This is going to be pressed into the baking pan. It's basically a shortbread. And we're going to press this mixture into our baking pan. Good shortbread like this will look crumbly, but be able to be compacted into an even layer. Okay, so this is pretty even. And now you can take a offset spatula like this and really press down. Now dock it. Docking is making little air holes in a surface. Just allow steam to escape. There are such things as docking tools, which you could also employ in this task, but this works very well. So now, before you put this in the oven, put this right into the freezer or the refrigerator and chill until it is firm. So here's our beautiful crust. It was baked in a 375 degree oven for about 20 to 22 minutes. And it is a lovely, dense, beautiful base for our pecan bars. And now I'm melting a half a cup, one stick of unsalted butter with two tablespoons of granulated sugar, a quarter of a cup plus two tablespoons of honey. This goes right in there. This is all the topping. I'm sure many of you have made pecan bars in the past. This just happens to be a really, really good recipe, which you will love. And a half a cup of brown sugar. I've been keeping it under wraps with a moist cloth so it doesn't get too hard. And a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. And there is one more ingredient, two tablespoons of heavy cream. So get all these ingredients incorporated. It gets nice and smooth and caramelly. And as soon as all of that is mixed together, two cups of the best pecans that you can find. Fresh, 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 very important. Nuts get rancid really quickly, and it is a shame to ruin a dessert, a salad, anything with a rancid nut. Be very careful, taste the nuts if you possibly can before you buy them, and a half a teaspoon of vanilla and turn the heat off, stir the nuts well to coat. And this mixture goes right on top of your beautiful crust. Make sure you smooth this out so that the pecans are well distributed. 
Pecans, if you don't know it, are the edible fruit of a giant tree originating in the Mississippi River Valley in the United States. And they are turned into pecan pie, pecan tassies, all kinds of candies, garnishes for salads, and most importantly right now for pecan bars. When choosing pecans in their shell, look for nuts that are really heavy for their size and make sure that the nuts do not rattle when you shake them. They shouldn't have any holes or any cracks in them. And if you're going to shell your own pecans, look for a pecan cracker. Very different than the walnut cracker that you use in your hands or the lobster cracker. This is a cracker that puts pressure on both ends of the pecan, splitting the shell so that you get the perfect whole halves. Now get this into your 325 degree oven and bake until the filling is bubbling. That takes only 15 to 20 minutes. Set your timer. So I'm just loosening with a knife underneath so that you know it comes apart from the parchment. Cut this into the bar size that you like. This is again a rich, rich bar. I'm using a serrated knife so that it neatly goes through the pecans. And you don't have to cut it all. You can cut half and save half for tomorrow. Now, that is a really pretty bar. And arrange it on a serving napkin, a serving platter, buttery, caramelly, crunchy. It's actually really pretty. So they're beautifully arranged, ready to serve. These bars can be stored in an airtight container at room temperature for up to one week. I don't think they're gonna last that long. They're sure to become your new favorite pecan bar. Enjoy. I'm chopping one last ingredient of many for what we call the dried fruit and nut health bars. These are delicious. And I love going hiking. And in Maine, I hike a lot with friends. And I always like to bring along a healthy snack. And these homemade energy bars are a better alternative to many of the packaged ones that you can find in the stores. They're filled with nuts and dried fruits. But the best part, there's no added sugar. It all comes from the natural dried fruits uh, that are uh, incorporated into the recipe. Now we have dates and we need one cup of dates. Pits have been removed. Very easy to remove a pit. Just spread the date in half and take out the pit. We want to soften these and puree them. So just cover with water and bring to a simmer. The date is a fruit of a palm tree, Phoenix dactylifera. I love dates so much. We have dried cherries, a third of a cup of dried cherries. These are dark black cherries and they are so delicious when they're dried like this. We have blueberries, papaya, macadamia nuts, pecans, and all kinds of grains. In this bowl, one and a half cups of dried oats. This is just regular oatmeal, ground very fine in the food processor. To that, we add three tablespoons of ground flaxseed. Everything in here is very, very healthy, found in the health food stores. Two tablespoons of oat bran, in addition to the oatmeal. Two tablespoons of wheat germ. I love wheat germ. It reminds me of my father. Every single morning he had a half a cup of wheat germ with non-fat milk. Cinnamon, a half a teaspoon, goes right in a half a teaspoon of salt, the black cherries, a half a cup of chopped toasted pecans, a half a cup of ground toasted pecans, just grind these in the food processor, a quarter cup of finely ground macadamia nuts, which are also lightly toasted, 
and a quarter of a cup of just coarsely chopped macadamia nuts. So you're getting macadamia nuts, pecans, and you have different textures, coarse and fine. A third of a cup of papaya, coarsely chopped. A third of a cup of dried blueberries. These are the little main blueberries, so you don't have to chop those. So this is basically it. It's a very simple mixture of a lot of things. So you have to do a lot of shopping. But if you have it, make sure you keep your oat bran and your flaxseed in tight container, tightly covered containers in the freezer to keep them absolutely fresh. So now, let's see, the dates are plumped up. You can drain them. Remember, no sugars in these bars, just the natural sugars from all these delicious sweet fruits. So you can put this right into the food processor with the honey. And you might have to use a little bit of that liquid and add a quarter of a cup of liquid from the dates. That should be enough, yes. So what you're really doing is breaking up the fiber of the dates and making it into a nice paste. If you looked hard enough, you probably could find date paste. But it's so easy to make your own. There, so. So this is actually pretty dry. I'm gonna add a little bit more of the date liquid. Just to make this moist enough so that I can press it into a prepared baking pan. Press this nicely into your parchment-lined baking pan. Looks so good. And this will bake in a preheated 350 degree oven until the center is firm and the edges are golden, about 20 to 25 minutes. Press firmly and get it right into the oven. Set your timer. So who knew that something this healthy could taste so good? I hope you've enjoyed today's show and don't forget to tune into the next episode of Martha Bakes. Bake these for your next hike. I think it's my favorite cookie of the moment. Absolutely superb. Just the perfect cookie. Today on Martha Bakes, I have four great cookie recipes for your cookie repertoire. Alexis's famous brown sugar chocolate chips. Really big, really thin, and really crispy, and lots of chocolate chips. And these are sable cookies made out of pot sable. They are crispy and delicate and perfect for tea time. And these big cookies, well, these are called old-fashioned sugar cookies. Very easy to make. And these have a flavoring of lemon juice and lemon zest. And in our cookie jar, these are chewy chocolate ginger molasses cookies. I think it's my favorite cookie of the moment. Absolutely superb. These four recipes are my gift to you from Martha Bakes. And now I'm going to make my favorite chocolate chip cookie. It's Alexis's brown sugar chocolate chips. Crispy and large and full of chocolate chips. Typical cookie ingredients, sugar, butter, 
four sticks of butter, one pound. Room temperature is good because then it uh, really cuts down on the mixing time. We're going to have put in one cup of granulated sugar and three cups of packed light brown sugar. Here we have our brown sugar. Make sure that the brown sugar is soft, malleable, so that it can really be packed in. And every now and then scrape down your bowl. We're using that new blade that has the rubber edge, which is very good for cookie batters. And two teaspoons of vanilla, best vanilla. When that's nicely creamed, we're going to add four eggs. Make sure you don't get any eggshells into your cookies. Very nice and creamy, a little bit crunchy. And now sift the dry ingredients. We're going to do one and a half teaspoons of salt and the baking soda, two teaspoons. And we need three and a half cups of all-purpose flour. One, two, three. And I really like these cookies because they don't seem like they have a lot of flour in them. They're very, very thin. Mix this all up. And two cups of best chocolate chips. And we're using Calibo, which is made in Belgium. So add your flour on low speed. Now this dough, once it's made, goes into the refrigerator to chill. And then it's easily scooped out with an ice cream scoop onto the baking sheet. And if you're really organized, you could actually make a lot of this batter ahead of time and keep it in packages in the freezer. And two cups of chocolate chips. This is 56% dark chocolate. I like the dark chocolate in these. This is a nice semi-sweet chocolate chip. You could use milk chocolate if you like. You could use even chunkier pieces of chocolate bits, but for the true look of this particular cookie, I think that this works very well. We're going to put this entire mixture right into the refrigerator and chill. Oh, for at least an hour. I just wanted to show you chilled, unchilled. It really does darken. That brown sugar starts to bleed into the rest of the ingredients. So that goes right into the refrigerator. And if you have a bowl of chilled dough, I have found over the years that these black iron cookie sheets are really good. I use them for puff pastry as well as for certain cookies. I like what happens if you see the finished cookie here, it has these concentric rings around. They only seem to happen like that on a black iron tray like this. I don't use parchment. I don't use sill pats. I just do it on the black iron. And these are available at really fine baking stores. I have this size, sort of half sheets, and I have full sheets too. And I'm using a three quarter ounce ice cream scoop and just three cookies per tray. You don't want these to run into one another. You want beautiful round cookies. One tray. And make sure your oven is preheated to 375 degrees. Now there's no need to flatten these out. They have so much sugar and so much butter that they flatten themselves out when baking. There, into the oven. 10 to 12 minutes in the middle of your oven. Set your timer, 10 minutes, and check. Ah, uh, yes, they look perfect. There they are. Let them stay on the cookie sheet just a minute or two. Loosen them with a big spatula. 
and cool the cookies thoroughly on cookie racks like this. See how nicely they come up? See how they've spread out thinly? Put on your next batch and get them into the oven. So now I'm going to make an old-fashioned sugar cookie that's infused with lemon zest and lemon juice, and it is really good. Three cups of all-purpose flour. And it's a drop cookie, so it's real easy to make. Dry ingredients all together in a bowl, and we have one teaspoon of baking soda, quarter of a teaspoon of salt, Whisk this together. The whisking does lighten the flour and does eliminate any lumps if there happen to be any. And in the bowl of a mixer, you can soften two sticks of butter and cream the sugar in the butter. One and three quarters cup of granulated sugar and a quarter of a cup of packed light brown sugar. Gives a nice color to the dough and an additional flavor. As soon as the butter and sugar is creamy, and it is, you can add two whole eggs, large eggs, if you will. And I've already zested the skin of a bright lemon. We need one tablespoon of zest and we want one tablespoon of fresh lemon juice, which will be approximately the juice of half of this lemon. These are so great, these lemon presses. Oh, I just love them. Now add your flour. Now the beautiful thing about this dough is that once made, ready to bake. So have your cookie sheets ready with parchment liners. And that's the dough. Okay, so now a flat scoop, three per sheet, because they do spread. And now you can just flatten that a little bit with the palm of your hand and sprinkle the tops with sanding sugar. and then a little bit of water. This helps the sugar adhere to the top of the cookie. And then add a little bit more sugar. And get this right into a 350 degree oven for about 15 minutes. Set your timer. Well, I think the cookies are done. Yes, they are. You can tell just by looking at them. But a beautiful golden color. So you can loosen them from the parchment, put them on racks to cool. They store very well. They're delicious the next day and the next day and the next day. They are an excellent cookie to add to your repertoire. And now I'm gonna show you how to make my favorite cookie of the moment. It is the chewy chocolate ginger molasses cookie. You need good chocolate. I'm using a Valrona bar. We need seven ounces cut into chunks. The best way to cut up chocolate is with a serrated knife. I have found it really works extremely well. And I'm weighing this chocolate. That's going to be seven ounces. That looks perfect. And one tablespoon of freshly grated ginger, very essential to the flavor of these cookies and into one and a half teaspoons of boiling water, one teaspoon of baking soda. And that's all softened up. And some freshly grated nutmeg. Just about a quarter of a teaspoon. There are lots of aromatics in this cookie dough. Get these all ready. Now cream the butter, one stick of butter half a cup of butter.
And you want a half a cup of dark brown sugar added to your butter and a quarter of a cup of white sugar. Get those ingredients nicely, nicely mixed up. And, uh, and now just kind of sift your dry ingredients. One and a half cups of all-purpose flour. plus one tablespoon of flour. Kind of essential. And to those dry ingredients, add your ground ginger, one and a quarter teaspoons, and a quarter of a teaspoon of cloves, and the cinnamon, one teaspoon. and your grated nutmeg, about a quarter of a teaspoon of nutmeg. And one tablespoon of cocoa powder. Whisk this all together. And into the sugar and butter, you can add your freshly grated ginger. And we need a half a cup of molasses. Now there's a little secret for getting molasses out of cup measures, you can just spray with a little bit of vegetable spray and measure your molasses, half a cup. It should slide right out of the cup. And I think we're ready to add the dry ingredients. Add that with your water with the baking soda. You can slide your molasses in. Slides out nicely. That vegetable spray really does a good job. Scrape down the bowl and then stir in the chocolate. And that's basically it. Now this dough has to chill uh, before you form the cookies because it is very, very moist. But when you make it, you'll see why I love it so much. The smell, the aroma, the scent of all those spices and the fresh ginger and the cocoa and the molasses, really, really good. And it's even better when it's baked into cookies. So scrape it down. This can be left in the refrigerator overnight and baked the next day. You can scoop out the cookies onto cookie sheets and chill those too if you like. But um, it is very easy. And we have some cookie dough in the refrigerator. I'll go get it and show you how to make the cookies. Using a one ounce ice cream scoop, form these into rounds. It makes 24 cookies, so you're gonna need four cookie sheets if you're gonna do them all at once. And uh, these get put into the refrigerator and chilled until they're hard. We have some chilled ones right here. The oven, by the way, is preheated to 325 degrees for these cookies. And we have some granulated sugar. Just roll the cookies in the sugar and put them right back on the parchment. Parchment is great. If you haven't used parchment before, it's a very nice addition to your kitchen. These cookies would uh, make kind of a mess on a cookie sheet. This way, there's very little cleanup. And get those right into the oven. 325 degrees. And they will flatten out, I promise. And here are the cookies. You can see the chocolate's melted all around. And they're all a uniform size, which is really nice when you're trying to pack them up for gifts or store them. Uh, it's nice to have that uniformity. Let these cool on the cookie sheets and then loosen them and put them on a rack. And these chewy chocolate ginger molasses cookies are sure to become a family favorite. Try them. I first published this recipe for Sabze cookies in 1982 in my entertaining book. 
and I've been making them ever since, and so have many, many other people. This is a French cookie made out of pâte sablée, which is a sugary, eggy dough that's used for tarts generally. But it also makes really good, small, fluted cookies. And the dough is made in the food processor. Uh, you start with sugar, two thirds of a cup, and just put that right into the food processor. And one and a half sticks of butter, pretty much room temperature, but not real, real soft. And you can process this. Add two egg yolks to the mixture, saving your egg white. I always say save it for a meringue or a uh, angel food cake. Mm. These eggs are extraordinary and they will make very, very yellow sable cookies. Now add a pinch of salt, one teaspoon of vanilla, and we're going to now also add some flour, the missing ingredient. First one cup, then another. And it's all purpose flour. Wrap the dough in a piece of plastic wrap in a nice rectangle. This dough has to be chilled before you roll it out. So here we have our dough. Just gather up the edges and flatten as you would pastry dough. This will all come together nicely after it is chilled. And here we have a square that's ready to roll out. And we want to work with a third of the dough at a time. So cover this with plastic wrap and roll very gently until it's about an eighth of an inch thick. You can see how nicely it rolls. Now you can roll this out anywhere from a quarter of an inch thick down to about an eighth of an inch thick. Now this must chill. So we're gonna put this into the refrigerator and I have another piece that's already rolled out and chilled so that I can cut it with our cookie cutter. Space them apart. The dough can be rolled again. It's not as pretty or pristine as the first rolling, but it works. There. Once cut, put them back in the refrigerator just so they're well chilled again. Oh, even a half an hour is perfect. And when you take them out, brush the tops carefully with a little bit of egg yolk mixed with some water. This egg yolk gives additional flavor to the cookie and helps the sanding sugar adhere to the surface. You can bake these with or without additional sugar on top. I just like how they look with the crunchy sugar. Love these cookies. And this is a fine sanding sugar. Just lightly, lightly sprinkle the tops. And these go right into a 325 degree oven for 12 to 15 minutes. And this is what the sabla looks like when it comes out of the oven. It's glistening, it's tender, it's just the perfect cookie. And I'm just finishing stacking the four cookies that we have just showed you how to make. Different sizes, different flavors, served at a party, you're gonna be a hero. And I am going to cover it with my 19th century dome and keep them fresh until the guests arrive. Now that, a pile of cookies. Enjoy from Martha Bakes.